Hello, this is Chef Michael. Uh, most of what we're cooking will be uh, semi-local, either coming from our garden, our friend Nabi who forages, and uh, the farmer's market. Other things we're gonna be producing, uh, an orange cranberry sauce, roasted sweet potatoes, both um, American style um, orange sweet potatoes, and we're also gonna have some Asian white yams or white sweet potatoes in there. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna start by roasting our sweet potatoes. We have um, the red ones, which are the Asian sweet potatoes, and they're more of a creamy whitish color inside. And then we have the orange sweet potato skins that have a traditional orange flesh. So we're just gonna rinse these off and I'm gonna stick them in the oven. I'll prick them a couple of times and we're gonna roast them so that they are um, beginning to soften, but I can peel them and not have them fall apart. Nothing special here. They've been rinsed off, put a couple of bricks in them just in case. We've got a, about a 350, 360 degree oven. Um, I'll check them in maybe half hour, 45 minutes, see where we're at. All right, those are done. Yep, yeah, we're good. They're fine. So we're a little under an hour here, 50 minutes or so. Um, I actually I don't want these to soften up much. I need to get them to cool down. Even just throw them in the fridge for a moment. These are going to be peeled. All right, uh, so we're gonna make some quick cranberry sauce. This is about the fastest cranberry sauce you can make. It's a raw preparation, so it's healthy. It's relatively low sugar compared to many of them. Uh, so it's an opportunity to make something that is appreciated and uh, you don't have to go buy it. Uh, so we're about an hour in on our uh, part-time permies uh, holiday meal preparation. Uh, so the dressing stuffing is done. Potatoes are cooling to be peeled. Uh, we've got some garlic here that's roasted. I'm going to put it away. I can cut off the top, squeeze out the roasted garlic when I need it. And so moving on to the cranberry sauce. Uh, one orange. Take the top and bottom off. Open it up, make sure it's limited on seeds. I like to cut out some of that coarse stuff. Get out, if it's a navel orange, get out the uh, pith and stuff at either end so you got um, this is nice it's a little thinner skinned um, it's just what I want I'm gonna cut the whole thing up the beauty of this recipe is you get an orange cranberry sauce but you get the sweetness and the bitterness of the orange so you use the entire peel and the pith minus some of these heavier pieces and trying to get the seeds out is always a bonus okay I got about Pound cranberries from the farmer's market, um, secondary source. There are a lot of cranberries growing around here, blueberries, cranberries, other berries. Uh, I hear a lot of the Amish uh, in this area and just south of us grow them. So put the oranges in, put the cranberries in. Uh, you could use a blender on pulse. Cuisinart works better. Put in a rough pound of cranberries to one, one maybe two oranges. Uh, one cup of sugar, <clears throat> a cup of sugar seems like a lot, but <clears throat> for any of you that make jam, two cups of sugar and one cup of fruit, sort of a standard ratio. Uh, if you look at what's in 
commercial cranberry jelly. I bet you it's a twice set at least. So, um, and you got that orange. This is Michigan uh, cane or Michigan beet sugar, sitting in a Dean's uh, New York golden vanilla ice cream bucket. <laughs> It. You can stir it if you want. This is a cranberry relish. It's really nice and, and fresh and relishy at the moment. It will cure um, overnight and be more of a sauce. So that's it. Um, not my recipe. Actually, I think it's been sitting on the back of some of the labels of certain cranberries for probably 100 years, but it's the easiest one out there. But you can cook this too. If you want to cook it down a little bit, you can cook it, um, but not necessary. Yep. Do you make that into the jelly form or no? If you cooked it, yeah, there's a lot of pectin, a lot of pectin in cranberries, but don't forget that citrus peel is another one of the high sources of pectin. A lot of times it's from apple or pear, um, quince from the seeds and the pith and the, the skin and stuff is a byproduct um, when we buy pectin, but some of it will actually say it's citrus base. So yeah, um, this will kind of start to set up by itself if you don't stir it but yeah if you cook this i don't know if you'd have to add any pectin at all i would say probably not um watch the acidity maybe a drop of uh maybe a drop of lemon juice but i think we got enough acidity too so that hold on all right so we're going to do some seared brussels sprouts and plus some turnips I haven't decided what I'm going to sear them with. Typically I sear them with some apples and a little bit of bacon, sometimes chestnuts, but it's a little redundant to what we have in our stuffing. So I'll probably just throw some apples and maybe maybe some bacon. I got some, some layered bacon uh, going. Alright, for these, all I'm going to do is check any uh, any bad spots, bad leaves, trim the ends on them. If they're a little bigger, Sometimes I like to notch them, just put an X in them. I'm going to blanch them. I'm going to blanch them half cooked uh, or less than half so that we don't have a hard Brussels sprout. You can roast them whole, that's fine. You can shred them or shave them and just use them as is. Um, these guys are so little, they're going to go real easy. You can also pull the petals off and the leaves, and if there's, uh, you know, if they're a little big or they fall off, you can saute at the end some of these little guys, although I like to get the ones that are kind of damaged. I just like to pull that off. But you could you could take these and quickly saute them at the end. Turnips you can peel or not peel. These are baby turnips. They, play, they look pretty clean. Uh, we're likely not going to peel them. Just going to trim them up a little bit. Uh, so I could blanch them quickly and then peel them with a, a towel. Just give them a little rub they've got a very thin skin on them just gonna cut these down so they blanch pretty quickly so all these cruciferous vegetables we think of them as bitter and not sweet for the most part although when we cook them uh, they end up getting pretty sweet and when we sear them and caramelize the edges of them They get even sweeter and that's kind of the goal here of how you transform cauliflower and Turnips and you know, Cabbage items and you know these really sweet nice things with a real good heavy sear on them so. Really quick blanch, got some salted water, a little ice water to shock them because I do want to stop the cooking so I don't want to cook. You know, overcook this real easily. Right, I'm gonna start pulling these out, especially with the little ones in there, and I don't anything I want to do is not under overcook them. So undercooking is fine. They're just small enough I could probably get away without blanching them. So when you blanch something, about the same amount of time as you cook it, there's usually about the right amount of time to chill it. But rapidly boiling water, turnips are going to go fast. 
Um, they seem like a hard vegetable, but especially when they're young, just in general, they're softer than a lot of the roots. It's just softened a little to the touch. So we're going to be searing them. They're going to get plenty of heat on them. Additional cooking time. You know, you can roast them, you can sear them, you can grate them up. There's really a lot of things you can do with them. They're they're amazing vegetable. I think they're maybe they'll be the new kale in a few years. Uh, we can all capitalize on it. Uh, you can make a Irish dish uh, called Cannon, which has a mash of, of potatoes and cabbage and other root vegetables. Um, my understanding is somewhat flexible to whatever you have on hand. Um, so that's. Uh, that's actually pretty tasty. It's surprisingly better than anybody would think. Uh, Alright, so we're just going to peel potatoes for mashed potatoes. Uh, it's not that big of a deal, but uh, things, so a couple ways you can do it. Cut the ends off because there's the least waste there and a lot of peeling around. Take a peeler. Top to bottom, one stroke, so you don't waste time unless it's a really big potato. That's it. You want big enough pieces that they're not going to starch out all over the place, but you also want them to uh, cook evenly. So cook, cutting most potatoes in half, quarter is really big potato more, is about right. Other way you can peel it. The advantage of this, this is pretty fast. You don't have to ever double peel anything. Um, you can get around any of those. Yeah, that funny stuff that's in there that caused a problem with the peeler, you can get rid of that. Then you can cut it in one piece. So that's a, especially for bigger potatoes, it's a good uh, commercial technique. You really have to go through and peel them all the way white clean if you want a good mashed potato or palm puree. Uh, I haven't decided yet if we're going to do a full on European palm puree and run it through a, a mill or if we're going to do an American mash a little bit lumpy. One more note about potatoes. Use russet potatoes for mashed potatoes or a highly starchy potato. Um, the flavor is not quite as uh, robust as a waxy potato, but for adding all the cream and getting the fluffiness, you need to use a waxy, I'm sorry, use a uh, starchy potato, a russet or an Idaho potato from Idaho, um, is uh, always your go-to for the best mashed potatoes. All right, next item, bonus item. Get little alien balls. Alien balls. Some of you probably know what these aliens are, some of you don't. So these are sun chokes, or Jerusalem artichokes. Uh, they look like mini sunflower type deals. A lot of people grow them as uh, wind blocks, feed the birds, and um, to break up the soil, and they produce a lot of uh, green manure. So people use them simply for composting. They also feed them to their animals, because I guess their animals love them. Uh, I don't care about any of that. Uh, we do like those things actually, but uh, we like to eat them. So these are um, the root, which are dug, and these are nice and clean, and these are on the larger size, really good and fresh. Uh, so you let them go for a year or two, and then they grow like weeds from uh, what everybody says. Can't get rid of them. They just go nuts. Uh, it's just got a little, you know, it's a starch root, and um, these are so clean, I don't have to do much to them. We're going to roast them, so that's kind of the bonus item. You can make, fry them and make chips. You can roast them. You can mash them and make a puree. Add a little potato in them. Uh, you can do them in all kinds of veg. Boil them. They're earthy. They're refreshing. Typically, they're sweet. And they grow in relatively poor soil. So they build your soil and you can eat them all winter. So a lot of times they're peeled. Um, I tend just to look for the stem in and any tough spots, and these are in beautiful shape. That's why I selected these. Uh, a number of people had them, but these are the... Uh, I just roughly cut them up, and I'm going to oil them, season them, 
and uh, roast them in a 375, 400 degree oven. Uh, they will eventually get kind of watery and break down. So you want to, you know, watch that they tenderize. Uh, skins can, as I said, get tough. Uh, so if they're older skins, knock off a lot of the skin, half the skin, whatever. Um, I tend to like it. I'm going to guess they're not a very high nutrient item like a lot of other starches and probably all the nutrients or almost all the nutrients are in the skin. So I started working with these at years ago, you know, high-end restaurants, a little hard to get a hold of. I'd say they're a little easier to get a hold of now, but farmer's market has them. Nobody's, they sell them cheap because nobody knows what to do with them. And uh, really, they're versatile. Put them in everything. Uh, next item, these are just for some uh, quick sauteed greens. I have a variety of greens. They're looking a little limp. We got them a week ago because no, uh, no market, uh, which is fine because they're sauteed. I'm going to pick out a couple things, and the rest is going to be perfectly good. I'll show you how to use them a little limpy. So we got some uh, bright light Swiss chard or you know rainbow Swiss chard. We got some nice little stock matured lacinato or uh, Tuscan kale. We got some type of other run-of-the-mill kale. Um, got an old leek that's been laying around, actually older than the leek we used earlier. So we're gonna show you how to clean up some stuff and make it usable despite a little bit of age on it. Mostly it's dehydration we're dealing with here because they weren't well wrapped up um, more than anything else. That way you can roast leeks whole or in big chunks, um, peel or char them on a grill and pull the um, outside burned stems off and uh, they get amazingly sweet also. I'm just starting to run some water because I want to re refresh and, uh, some of these greens and I want to uh, uh, get any dirt off of them. So these are actually on stock. I can cut them off, so it's kind of the end of a. Just sold them to me as a. As a piece. Never tried the stock on a kale. That'd be sweet. I don't know. Let's see, give this a quick chop chop now. Okay, so what you can do if you got leaves that are a little quicker cooking, a little more tender than stalks, you can just kind of pull them either forwards or back, whichever way they like to come off. Stalks, just like celery, you can cut them straight across and dice them up really nice and fine. Um, maintain a lot of their color, just watch if you had a lot of vinegar or acid, they could lose some color. Only thing I can say about greens, uh, though they can revive a little bit in here. They'll take on a little moisture, but it doesn't really matter. Um, plunge them. Actively plunge them up and down. Get all the sand out, and then do it in enough water that there's water below the level of the greens or whatever you're straining them in. I watch people all the time clean greens. Yes, chef. Yes, chef. I clean the greens, and I got about that much water, and they're just mixing the sand around. So if there's a lot of sand, spinach, you need a bath because you need, while you're plunging that, all that heavy sand, that rock material, to go to the bottom and disappear into the sink. That's the whole point of cleaning them aside from the hydration. All right, so we're back to the sweet potatoes. They've been in the fridge just cooling off a little bit so we can handle them. Um, a little soft. So sweet potato, all we're going to do is peel them hand peel them, scrape them, whatever we need to do to get, um, get the skin off. So roasting a sweet potato, by the way, it creates lets, uh, the carbohydrates, the sugars come out and become um, sweeter than boiling them. So it's, it's going to intensify the flavor. 
how we finish these. We're probably gonna finish them with a little maple syrup, brown sugar, cinnamon sticks, the standard. So just clean out any bad spots, set them up. I'm not necessarily gonna cook them in here, I'm just holding them in here. These are peeling pretty easy. They are just slightly warm and chilled for, I don't know, half hour or more. I think about an hour by now. Uh, yeah, I guess they don't have a, I guess they don't have a commercial cooler with a fan blowing them. These are, <laughs> they were mounted up a little bit. I didn't expect them to get all the way cold. Just wanted to take the edge off them. And they'll firm up a little bit as they sit here overnight. And there's all these other Asian yams and sweet potatoes. Some grow really big. I've had quite a few Caribbean and Asian yams in New York on uh, the markets. But um, this, this is a good variety. I don't know what variety it is. got to ask Nobby. It's something she likes. It's probably it says Cor it's Korean. It's got to be a Korean sweet potato because that's what she knows. So it's a good one. Thank you.